My name is Andrew Pinsent. I'm the research director of the Ian Ramsey Centre and the managing editor of this new series. Like the other authors and editors here tonight, I'm delighted at the launch of, this, of the first two volumes of What Will We Believe? grow into a highly regarded series of original academic works engaging with big questions in science and religion. The format of the volumes will consist mostly of academic monographs by established scholars uh, with, a, with a, a small number of additional edited volumes. For tonight's launch, we have one volume in each of these two formats. We have Alison McGrath's new monograph, The Territories of Human Reason, and a 13-chapter volume edited by Peter Harrison and John Roberts, Science Without God? Question mark. This series is, in our view, timely, given the growing impact of the field of science and religion. In some ways, what is explored by this field is scarcely new. I'd like to point out, when 4th century Christians try to write a creed to offer an answer to the question, what is Jesus Christ, they used a term, consubstantial, also translated as of one being with the Father. That term wasn't drawn from Scripture, wasn't drawn from the Bible, but it was inspired by the philosophy of biology, especially the unity of living and growing things. So there's a long history of drawing from scientific ideas uh, to inform theology. Over the last few years in the Faculty of Theology and Religion, uh, the papers in Science of Religion have become among the most popular for undergraduates, and the relaunched master's course has produced the highest graded papers across the faculty at graduate level in each of the last two years. Some really superb writing. More generally, both at the university level and in the great many events that the Ian Ramsey Centre supports for schools in the UK and internationally, there seems to be an interest in science and religion insofar as it provides a kind of modern safe space for exploring big questions. What is studied under this field has therefore been historically fruitful and is also growing in contemporary importance. Hence, there is a need for this series, which has as its primary target readership professional scholars and teachers in the fields of theology, philosophy, and religion with research and teaching interests in or connected with the field of science and religion. We also anticipate significant secondary audiences, including uh, professional natural scientists with theological or philosophical interests, of which, of which, by the way, there are very many here at Oxford, uh, scientists who want to explore the inter interface and interplay of the natural sciences with, for example, the philosophy of religion or Christian theology. We also ant anticipate interest by graduate students in theology, <coughs> philosophy, religion, and the natural sciences who are generally interested in the field of science and religion. And interest we, we also anticipate from seminarians, those going into some kind of pastoral ministry, who appreciate the significance of this field for preaching, cultural engagement, and in apologetics on the big questions. So with these three goals in mind with these goals in mind, I'm pleased to introduce our three speakers this evening. The first speaker will be Tom Perridge, Senior Commissioning Editor for Religion at Oxford University Press, who's going to speak on behalf of the publishers. Would you please welcome Tom Perridge. Thank you, Andrew. Um, so, yes, I, I'm Tom Perridge. I'm, I'm the editor for Religion um, at OUP. Um, and um, Andrew's given you, I think, a very good summary there of what, uh, what the series is all about. Um, so I won't repeat that, but... Um, I would just like to say that um, it feels very appropriate to be launching this important new series um, with books by not only two of the world's most eminent scholars on the relationship between science and religion, but um, also the current and previous director of the Ian Ramsey Centre itself um, and holders of the Idraeus Chair in Science and Religion here at Oxford. Um, and indeed, uh, Peter's predecessor, John Henry Brook, is also a contributor to um, Peter's volume. So, that's, um, so that ties in very nicely. Um, I've known both Alistair and Peter for many years now, um, and I've been hoping that I could persuade them both to publish with the press for just about as long as I have known them. So um, it's really a delight to be here and to be celebrating finally publishing them both um, tonight. Um, Alistair first raised the possibility of this series with me um, a little over two years ago, um, and I immediately leapt at the idea. 
it was clear that it was going to fulfill a real need by offering readers innovative books by established scholars dealing with the key questions in the field of science religion. Um, and it fits perfectly with um, OUP's mission to disseminate the very best in research and scholarship worldwide. Um, Alistair is, of course, a very experienced author. Um, and this experience shows in his professionalism and efficiency. He's been an absolute joy to work with as both a series editor and an author. And I very much look forward to our continuing collaboration. Thank you, Alistair. Um, and similarly, Peter and his co-editor, John Roberts, were terrific to work with too. Um, they responded positively and constructively to the suggestions put forward by the series editor and our external readers, and then submitted the final manuscript on time and in good order. Um, so thanks to you both and to all your contributors. Um, and I'd also like to say thank you to the managing editor of the series, Andrew, for all his um, very hard work behind the scenes. Um, so I'll hand you over to Peter and Alice to talk to you more about the books themselves. But I would like to remind you that we do have copies for sale. Um, we'd be very pleased to see you um, after the talks back in the lobby. Thank you very much. Just before going any further, I mentioned that uh, we're going to have straight talks um, to begin with. So Peter will speak and then Alice will speak. But there will be a time uh, for Q&A at the end, but that won't be recorded, so we can sort of let rip at that point. Okay. Um, so the first, uh, the first uh, main speaker, professional, Professor Peter Harrison, he's an Australian laureate, fellow and director of the Institute of Advanced Studies in the Humanities at the University of Queensland. And he's going to introduce his volume of essays, Science Without God? Question mark, Rethinking the History of Scientific Naturalism. Professor Harrison was formerly the Andreas Idrios Chair of Science and Religion here at Oxford. And over this fortnight, this week and next week, he's also delivering the 2019 Bampton Lectures at the University of Oxford. If you get the chance to go next week, next Tuesday, I do encourage you to sign up and come along. So would you please welcome Professor Peter Harrison. Right, I think we're set to go. Look, let me begin by thanking uh, Tom Perridge from OUP for taking on this series. I think it's a, it's a great initiative and we're really pleased that, uh, that OUP has run with it. And of course, thanks to Andrew and Alistair. Uh, e editing series is, is serious, hard work, and it's largely unrewarded and, and unrecognised. So I'm, I'm delighted that you've, you've both taken this on. Uh, and, and, and I congratulate you on your discriminating choice of the, uh, the, the second volume in the series, I think. Uh, and, and thanks to you for coming. Um, as, as Andrew has said, um, it, it is Valentine's Day. I had to be here. You had a choice. So thanks for coming. Um, <laughs> What I'm going to do uh, in the time I have, I want to actually begin by speaking about the person to whom uh, this volume is, is dedicated, and then I'm going to say a little bit about the genre in which this book appears, and then I'll give you a quick summary of the content and, and some, of, some of the chapters. And I, I won't give too much away there, because I think you, know, you should be um, consulting the book yourselves. But... The book is dedicated to Ron Numbers, who many of you will know is a distinguished historian of science who spent many years at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, and as I said, so the book is dedicated to him. Ron is an unusual figure in, in academe because... Um, he, he is not at the extreme end of the introversion scale. I think he's just a few notches back. So to most of us, he looks like a raging extrovert. But this carries over into the way Ron has a particular talent for bringing people together in the history of science to work on specific projects. And whereas we tend to think about collaboration as the kind of thing that happens in the sciences, and the sole authorship model as the kind of thing that happens in the humanities, Ron has kind of pioneered a style for historians of science to get together and to work on specific problems and to make 
significant interventions in the field, and I think he's had a, a, an important mark on the field of science and religion and has really uh, made a difference. Here are two of the key works going right back to 1986, an edited collection called God and Nature, and it's in this volume that we encounter for the first time the word complexity in relation to the historical relations between science and religion. And we now know that this is really a key term for understanding the historical relations between science and religion. And he brought together a dream team uh, to, to write that, that book. In 2003, we kind of have an updated version uh, which Ron irreverently referred to as Son of God and Nature, but the official title, uh, When Science and Christianity Meet. And what both of these volumes do is attempt to set the record straight about the historical relations between science and religion by bringing together uh, experts from a range of historical periods uh, to, 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 to do their thing. So two very important uh, uh, works. Um, and then moving into uh, this century, three volumes that Ron was involved in, um, and the first of these, Wrestling with Nature, uh, 2010. Um, I was fortunate to work with Ron on this volume. And the way in which we put these volumes together is we would typically bring the authors together at a meeting. We'd have a brief for them. They would read a little bit of their papers and then there would be critique about both content and uh, accessibility and these, uh, these get-togethers were terrific fun. Um, I think Wrestling With Nature we met in Wisconsin. Uh, biology and ideology, for ideology from Descartes to Dawkins we met uh, at Cambridge. And Alistair, I recall, coming over and making a contribution. And Alistair has the last chapter in that volume. And then Science and Religion Around the World with John Headley Brook, the first of the Idrios professors here, uh, and again with Ron, looking at science and religion outside uh, Western contexts. Uh, I really enjoyed being part of, I was part of all of these three volumes, very much enjoyed the last one where I had the chance to work and write together with David Lindbergh, who was a partner in crime for Ron Numbers uh, for many years at, at the University of uh, Wisconsin-Madison. And... If writing an edited collection uh, is a kind of collaborative enterprise, um, actually co-authoring in the humanities is very rare. Um, and for me to co-author with a, a historian as distinguished as Dave Lindbergh was, was a great pleasure. Um, and I think I've only ever co-written one other thing since then. So um, don't make anything out of that. So what I would say, though, is that in each of these volumes, to go back to the point about... Uh, Interventions. What we did with Wrestling in Nature was to talk about uh, how the concept of science is historically relative, which is to say that people didn't have much of a conception of science prior to the 19th century. Biology and ideology was a discussion about how biology is often weaponised for ideological purposes. Science and religion around the world, as I've already said, talks about uh, the, the different uh, uh, cultural contexts in which science-religion relations uh, happen. And just the last three, and you can see we're actually starting to have a trajectory in a particular direction with these. 2010, Galileo goes to jail and other myths in the history of science and religion. So here we looked at a, a, a whole range of myths. The classic one, of course, is the Galileo myth, but there are a range of other myths. Newton's apple and other myths about science. And then most recently, last year, the idea that wouldn't die the conflict between science and religion. And with these books, we're really looking at the idea of historical conflict between science and religion as a long-standing myth that, sadly, whatever we historians say about it seems to get little purchase on the public imagination. So there's something else going on. It's not a deficit in information. It's it's a genuine myth in the sense that it's a way of, of shaping people's attitude to the, to the world. But I better get to the point about what uh, my book is about. But what I want to say is that over the years, 
partly owing to the influence of Ron Numbers, we've actually assembled a group of historians who tackle these historical myths. And uh, this core of people is uh, the Mythbusters. And we've corralled the Mythbusters for one last ride and uh, produced this, uh, along with a few, um, a few newbies. So what is the myth that we are tackling in this book? And it's essentially the myth that associates science with a naturalistic worldview. And there are th kind of three aspects to that, I think. And one is that science is pretty much the same as naturalism. What is naturalism? Naturalism is the view that there are no spiritual or supernatural entities, simplifying it somewhat. And here then the idea that history is characterised by an ongoing conflict between or competition between naturalistic explanations on the one hand and uh, religious or supernaturalistic explanations. So here we have a kind of special case of the broad the thesis that talks about science and religion conflict. Okay? So naturalism versus supernaturalism is another way of thinking about uh, this standard problem. And that's the myth we're tackling. So um, you probably won't be able to read this table of contents, but you can pick up the book outside and have a look. But what I'm going to do now is to speak about um, four or five of these chapters and then I'll, I'll wrap up and hand over to, to Alistair. So what happens in the introduction? I've got a pretty good idea what happens there. Um, what you do in an introduction is you talk about what's going to be in the rest of the book, but you also attempt to introduce some of the key concepts. And the key concept in this discussion is the distinction between the natural and the supernatural. And what we find is, um, when we look at history, that this is a very shaky uh, dichotomy. Uh, and it's certainly not, as the philosophers would say, an exclusive disjunction, which is to say, in the present, we tend to think natural and supernatural as categories that don't overlap in any way. In the past, even when there were conceptions of the supernatural right, and the natural, and this wasn't for all of history, they're very messy and they're not quite what we think about them uh, today. Let me just give you... Um, uh, an example. Well, what we know for a start, for example, is that the terminology of natural and supernatural really doesn't emerge in a strong way until about the 13th century. People just don't think in those terms, right? So the idea that there could be an ongoing conflict between these ways of understanding the world is really not even conceptually possible in the West before uh, the Middle Ages, and it certainly doesn't happen then. Let me give you, going right back to the Greeks, an example. When Aristotle talks about the natural world, he talks about it in terms of four causes. The material, and you don't need to know what these are, but I'll just give you the names. The material, the formal, the efficient, and the final. And the final one is really the most important of all. And for Aristotle, the final cause of motion in the universe is God. You can't talk about physics without talking about God. Does it make any sense in this conception of how nature operates to make a distinction between the natural and the supernatural? It makes no sense at all. The possibility that there could be a competition between natural and supernatural in this case is an utter nonsense. Moving on, when we get to uh, Christian understandings of nature, here again what we tend to find is that a supernatural understanding of how the world operates underpins notions of the regularity and intelligibility of nature. So that the investigation of nature is typically, for most of history, premised on the idea that the regularities of nature are to be understood in terms of a divine order to the natural world. Let me give you a specific example. Uh, when John uh, Philoponus in the 5th century what he says from his Christian perspective is, I do not believe that the heavenly bodies are divinities. All right? So here's a traditional view. Heavenly bodies are self-moving divinities. He says, no, they're not. Why not? Because he's a Christian monotheist. This then uh, motivates a particular understanding of impetus that then influences Gal Galileo's conception later in the 17th century 
going right back to a fundamental idea about the heavens are essentially inert and require something to move them, right? And, and that turns out to be God. Interestingly, this is Isaac Newton, uh, you know, boiling it down somewhat, this is Isaac Newton's view. Moving to the Middle Ages, as, I, as I've said, we first get an idea of a formal distinction between the natural and the supernatural, and we get supernaturalis being th- thrown around uh, as, as a term. Mostly it's, a, it's, it's not in relation to nature, but in relation to supernatural gifts versus natural gifts. But insofar as it refers to nature, here's the distinction that's working. Natural things are understood to be caused both by God and by natural things. And the natural things have their own capacities by virtue of uh, capacities that God has implanted within them. And God cooperates when these things perform their inherent activities. So natural things always involve divine activity, both concurring with and, uh, and, and the inherent properties that God has created within things. Supernatural things happen when there are no natural agents involved whatsoever. But the key thing here is that for anything in nature to work at all requires supernatural activity. And when we then move to the 17th century, the period of the scientific revolution, what's interesting about the change that happens there is that this idea that things in nature have inherent inherent properties that God has put in there disappears completely. And as a consequence of that, matter is inert, particles, God is then required to do all of the work. So whereas we often tend to think that in the transition from the Middle Ages to the scientific revolution, the shift is between a kind of supernatural faith-based set of explanations in the Middle Ages and a scientific naturalistic set of explanations in the 17th century, it's completely the opposite. That in the Middle Ages, we have a far more naturalistic approach, and in the 17th century, it's a supernaturalistic approach. And the key here is a conception of laws of nature, laws of nature authored by God, and God essentially is doing virtually all of the work in the natural world. Now, in a sense, this is a kind of fateful step because it then makes possible the redescription of that supernatural activity as purely natural, and that's what happens in the 19th century. But I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. That's the introduction. Let me just go on to, uh, to talk about just a few chapters. Darren LaHue talks about the classical period, and what he shows here is that the standard view about what happens in ancient Greece is that we get a shift from the myths of the poets, Homer and Hesiod, to the natural sciences of the Ionian philosophers. We get a move from mythos to logos, it's often said. (coughs) What this chapter shows is that that's complete nonsense, that myth and logos exist, coexist together, and that the Greeks believed their myths. They never gave them up. That's the short version of that chapter. Here's chapter two, naturalistic tendencies in medieval science. What Mike Shank shows here is that we have in the Middle Ages the birth of what we would call methodological naturalism. So that theologically inclined medieval thinkers uh, argue that um, Aristotle was pretty much right in his scientific views or natural philosophical views and so that there is a discourse that's possible between medieval thinkers and the thinkers of antiquity based on a kind of naturalistic conception of the world, bearing in mind that by naturalistic in this context is meant things operating on the capacities that God has implanted within them with God's concurrence and cooperation, right? But then there is a common way of understanding how the natural world operates that Christian thinkers share with with the Greeks. Uh, and, and, and thinkers like Albert the Great and after him Thomas Aquinas will have an expression uh, de, de, de naturalibus natur, natural, natural, naturali, naturaliter, which is to say, speaking of nature naturalistically, we exclude miraculous activities, okay? And that's how we do uh, natural science. Moving on very quickly, I know a bit about this chapter as well. And here we have the idea, we tend to think of laws of nature as being the end point of explanation in the sciences. 
Laws of nature are the invention of the 17th century. Descartes is the key figure, but the English natural philosophers like Newton and Boyle will pick up this idea. Laws of nature are laws authored by God and instantiated by God in the natural world. That's where they come from. That's the whole idea of a law of nature. It's a divinely uh, imposed order that's imposed directly on the natural world. The idea that there could be a, com a, a conflict between supernaturalistic and naturalistic <coughs> understandings here is just so far off the mark that it, it's, it's, uh, it, it's utterly incoherent. Um, so the chapter's a bit longer than that, but that's the, that's <laughs> the, that's the bottom line. Matt Stanley, now here is the, the really fascinating part of the story. We get to the 19th century and we still have uh, leading physicists arguing that laws of nature are the laws of God. But at the same time, we have this redescription that I've already referred to where these laws of nature can be seen as self-sufficient and that God can be actually removed from the picture and laws of nature become the self-sufficient explanation for what's going on in the natural world. And that is the big move that takes place that makes modern naturalism possible. Right? And it's only possible because we don't ask ourselves, where do the laws of nature come from? Right? So it's very interesting about what counts as an explanation has shifted between now and then. And it's really that change in what counts as explanation that's made the difference. Right, I think that's the last one. There's a lot more chapters, right? But, but this has given you some idea of a bit of a counter trajectory to the standard uh, viewpoint. So, last one is Bernie Lightman. Bernard Lightman, um, who, who is probably the most distinguished uh, historian of science of the 19th century. And what, what Lightman shows is how a, a group of key thinkers in the 19th century essentially invented scientific naturalism. And Thomas Henry Huxley uh, was, was one of the key figures. And these guys basically then made up a history that went something like, oh, in ancient Greece they had myths, they got rid of them when they rationalised the world, then the Christians came along and wrecked it for the Middle Ages, and then we finally got back on track with the scientific revolution. That's the story uh, they made up, and a lot of people still believe it, um, but they're wrong. Okay, so uh, wrapping up, um, these are the, the conclusions, but uh, as I say, there's a lot more in the book. So um, the natural-supernatural distinction is a, is a historical event, and it starts in the 13th century. And only in the 19th century do we get this notion of an exclusive disjunction between natural and supernatural, right? And it's a big mistake to think you can project that invention back into the past. History is therefore not characterised by some simplistic conflict between two competing forms of understanding. That never happened. And then, uh, finally, this historical story that naturalism was invented by the Greeks uh, and then forgotten by the Christians or opposed by the Christian Middle Ages and then revived in, in modern science, which you still encounter in some introductory... Uh, science texts and indeed in some introductory histories of science, that is largely um, a myth. And that's where I will finish. Thank you. Well, thank you, Peter. And I'm very glad that you've um, focused on this issue of the supernatural. Uh, about 15 years ago, I remember doing a computer analysis of all the instances of Thomas Aquinas' use of the term supernatural, and it's totally unlike what most of the commentators think. Uh, he used the term as graced nature or transfigured nature, not as anti-nature or beyond nature, and it's um, quite a different to, to the common conception. So that's really uh, whetted our appetite, a wonderful uh, a summary there. Um, and then we have our, our second main speaker, Professor Alison McGrath, the current Andreas Idrios Professor of Science and Religion here at Oxford, also Professor of Divinity at Gresham College, and has got a host of other uh, awards, positions. If you go on the website, it's just amazing. Um, and he's going to introduce his monograph, The Territories of Human Reason, Science and Theology in an Age of Multiple Rationalities. Please welcome Professor McGrath.
Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's really good to be here. And what I want to do is talk a little bit about this book. And it is, I think I have to say to you, a rather um, tendentious topic, but I think you'll find it's also very interesting. There we go. Here we are. The title um, is a teaser. It's saying, in effect, look, when we survey the way in which human reason is used to engage the world, we find, whether we like it or not, that actually we use different approaches to engage different aspects of reason. And in many ways, what this book is doing is it's taking the image of mapping. Peter Harrison does this very effectively in his book, The Territories of Science and Religion. And it's trying to look at the way in which we use reason to engage different questions. And in many ways, this is about complexification. And I begin, really, by looking at a quote from John Dewey, an American philosopher, many of you will know him. And this is a rather nice quote. He says that, in his view, the deepest problem of modern life was our collective and individual failure to integrate our thoughts about the world with our thoughts about value and purpose. In other words, here's how the world works. What's it all about? Value and meaning, functionality. Very different. And the question I became interested in is this one. How can we follow Dewey and try and bring these things together while acting rationally throughout the whole process? And the point I'm making is this, that in thinking about meaning or purpose or value or about how the world functions, you're actually thinking in quite different ways, using different criteria, different methodologies. How on earth can you bring these things together when you use quite different intellectual trajectories to get to these in the first place. And in many ways, that's the issue that lies behind this monograph. And it's really about there being a single faculty of human reason. And yet, when we operationalize this, in other words, when we bring our reason to bear on different disciplines, when we're embedded in different cultural contexts, we find that this actually works out in different ways. It's not new. This book came out in 1996, uh, A Single Reason and Many Rationalities. And basically, it's a collection of essays just saying this is interesting, it's difficult, it raises some very significant questions. And this monograph really tries to open these up. And in many ways, what it is doing is it's opening up this whole question of how you can have dialogue between disciplines when they use quite different methodologies. And of course, it makes perfect sense to use Christian theology and the natural sciences as a specific case study as being really important. And it allows us to focus on that important example, but also to open up those more general questions about how you can do interdisciplinary studies in the first place. And the main point to make here is that it's a simple observable fact that there is historical and cultural variance in modes of reasoning over place and time, both in the past, but also in the present. And in many ways, we see this, for example, within disciplines, which very often develop specific research methods, specific criteria, which are very much determined by the objects of their study. And you find communities arising around these studies, and they develop their methods and their criteriologies with their objectives in mind, and they are different from those used by other communities. And so in many ways, the issue I'm wrestling with is this, and I think many of you will recognize this, that each science seems to be characterized by the nature of its object and hence has to respond to that object in a way that's appropriate. And this means, really, there is no single way of doing things, no matesis universalis, to use Descartes' very famous phrase, uh, because we have to deal with these individual methods developed for investigating individual fields. So I give some examples to try and make this rather difficult point more easy. And this is Stephen Rose, a biologist, and look at what he says here. As a materialist, he says, as all biologists must be, I am committed to the view that we live in a world that is an ontological unity, but I must also accept an epistemological pluralism. And in many ways, that's a very good summary of the dilemma which lies behind this book. We have one world, we have one faculty of human reason, and yet we seem to end up using different methods to investigate different aspects of it. In other words, we have an epistemological pluralism to investigate reality. And I guess the question that begins to emerge from this is, can we begin to bring things back together and integrate the insights we achieve 
from different disciplines. And Stephen Rose gives a parable. It's not a very biblical parable. It's about five biologists and a frog. And the question being asked is, why did that frog jump? And, of course, the evolution of biologist makes the point, well, if it didn't, you know, it would not survive, and so, in effect, it would not be passing on its genes. There would be others who would say, well, of course, it's all to do with the transmission of electrical impulses, which cause uh, muscles to contract, and so on. And Rose's point is that each of these five biologists are offering different explanations of why a frog jumped in this particular little wood little glade, but each of them is right. And each of them re reflects the specific interests and methods of this particular biological discipline. And the whole truth is basically all of these somehow brought together. And so in many ways, the question that Stephen Rose is asking is, how can you begin to, in effect, be specific, this, 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 and then be able to bring them together and say, the bigger picture is this. And in many ways, that seems to me to be the really interesting question. Because many of you will have read um, E.O. Wilson's book, Consilience. The word goes back, of course, to William Hewell in the 19th century. But it's this idea of trying to bring things back together again. Things have become separate, they've become fragmented. It must be some way of trying to bring them back together. And Wilson offers an approach which I think is very interesting, but unfortunately, it links it to the Enlightenment's goal of creating a grand unified knowledge based on a set of universal laws, and it privileges the place of the natural sciences. And so the question I was wrestling with is, is there some way in which we can do this without having to buy into the Enlightenment monomyth of a universal rationality, and without having to privilege any discipline, but to try and say we need to bring a wide variety of insights together. And so I think the issue really is how on earth can we begin to weave together, to bring together, to hold together disciplinary insights without having to accept the notion of some privileged form of rationality, such as that advocated by the Enlightenment, or treating the natural sciences as privileged. And so this book really sets this out. And many people have read Eugene Wigner's Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics. But one of the points he makes there is that when we look at the natural world, we try to represent it, we find there are lots of little pictures. And his question is, can we find an ultimate truth, a big picture, which in effect is, for him, a picture which is a consistent fusion into a single unit of the little pictures? And that seems to me to be something that actually lies behind so much thinking about the world. Is there some way in which we can bring things together and somehow deal with this fragmentation of knowledge and see if there is this bigger picture which can be discerned and then mentally inhabited? So it is, I think, a very worthwhile thing to do. So the method I use is I begin by, in effect, looking at this empirical issue that human beings have used and continue to use multiple rationalities in different cultures, in different disciplines. And actually, it, it's not difficult to do, I have to say. And you might think, for example, that very famous research program, Beyond Rationality, which is there at the London School of Economics, and what they're trying to do is to figure out what these domain-specific rationalities are, how you calibrate them, how you bring them together. And also, interestingly, if you have rationality as a virtue and irrationality as a vice, then how on earth do you develop a notion of irrationality in each of these disciplines? So it is interesting. But also, of course, we have to look at the whole question of how communities begin to develop these distinct methods. And so just to look at one chapter in the book, I'm looking at what I call social aspects of rationality and talking about the whole idea of epistemic communities. What those are are basic communities of people working on a single task and beginning to develop the research methods, the criteria, which will allow them to undertake that task and create knowledge outputs. And you will not be surprised to know that different epistemic communities end up with different approaches, but somehow we have to be able to enable these epistemic communities to talk to each other. For example, getting scientists to talk to theologians.
So in many ways, that is the task that lies behind it. And so what I try to do is to use a single case study. In other words, the relation of natural science and Christian theology to explore something which I hope you'll agree is interesting in itself, but which also gives us a kind of model for thinking about interdisciplinarity or even transdisciplinarity. And that seems to me to be something enormously important because all of us here at Oxford or indeed elsewhere tend to be siloed in our own distinctive research um, communities and the issue is how we can be enriched or challenged by those working in alternative fields. And so we might look at, for example, how these things emerge within communities. The question of knowledge production, the communal evaluation of data, the development of theories, and the criteria by which theories may be assessed. And in effect, you find what I guess you might expect you find, which is that each community begins to develop thoughts about this, but they are developed by this community, they're not imposed ab initio or a priori, and they emerge in the course of practice. They're not somehow written into the fabric of the universe, they are things that emerge as these communities actually practice and discover how best to implement their research objectives. And so that, I think, is important. It may seem to create a problem, which is that, in effect, we have the issue of the fragmentation of knowledge, but at least we're being realistic and asking, how can we begin to bring these things back together again? And so what I do is, in effect, begin by looking at these problems, the failure of the Enlightenment vision of a single rationality, the obvious example of um, multiple rationalities across history and within disciplines right now, Issues like, for example, um, epistemological privilege, particularly with um, the Europeans and North Americans, and of course, what is now called epistemological decolonization, which you find in Africa and Latin America. These are all issues about which rationality we choose rather than the one that's imposed upon us by somebody else. And so it's a question, really, of trying to work out how, to go back to that question I raised right at the beginning, we say, look, it's obvious that, for example, when we look at the natural sciences or um, the whole discipline of ethics or discipline of theology, they do seem to use different methodologies. And it'd be awfully nice if they could talk to each other, but do I need to switch rationalities if I am going to be able to do this, or is there some way of dealing with this? And so the book tries to begin to map out possibilities for this kind of interdisciplinary dialogue. And so I think there are three possible strategies. All of them are problematic, but all of them, I think, can be made to work in some shape or form. And the first of these is simply to say, look, there, there are clearly different rationalities involved in different disciplines, and we just have to be pragmatic about this and say we don't need to be able to, in effect, suddenly stop thinking this way because we are in this discipline, because we want to talk to somebody else. We, in effect, accept their way of thinking without having to immerse ourselves in it, and we value the outputs and try to correlate those. And it may be pragmatically helpful, but I think it is unsatisfactory at a theoretical level because it's very eclectic. It simply seems to offer descriptive accounts of a complex reality which seem to lack conceptual rigor. But for many people, that's a good starting point. Or we might say, given that there are clearly a multiplicity of rationalities, let's try and find, if you like, the lowest common denominator. Is there something that's common to all of them? And we can begin to use that as a way of generating interdisciplinarity. And again, that is helpful, but it is very limited. And very often, by focusing on what they have in common, you simply fail to appreciate what they have that is distinctive and gives them their particular insights, which actually you want to incorporate into this kind of dialogue. So, you know, again, it might work, but there are questions. Or thirdly, Instead of looking for the lowest common denominator, you stand back and ask, is there a still bigger 
understanding of rationality, if you like, a meta-rationality, which is capable of accommodating divergence across disciplines and allowing them to be seen within a greater whole. I think this is probably the most ambitious way of engaging the issue. It has a lot of imaginative appeal, and I quite like this. But I'm aware there are problems, and here are some of them. One of them is, of course, perspectival privilege, by which I mean you cannot really avoid the question of saying, well, of course, there, there is this approach and this approach and this approach, and actually, this one's best or this one's right, and I'm just being generous and accommodating the other ones. You know, in effect, you, you, you position yourself on this range of possibilities, and in doing so, very often, you privilege that particular position. So I think there is an issue there, but I think it's one we can engage with. But the other one, of course, is this constant danger of what we call intellectual colonization, in which the perspectives of one epistemic community are treated not simply as normative, but as privileged, and in effect are used to enfold other communities within its scope. And of course, the example I'm sure many of you are thinking of is scientism, which insists we think of every question as a scientific question and can be answered on scientific grounds. And of course, it's just not like that. But nevertheless, we need to be aware of those. So as you'll be aware, as I'm moving towards the end of this presentation, I have not solved these issues at all. But in many ways, what this book is doing is opening up some questions that I think are really interesting and really important. And many would say that perhaps there is something about the way we function as human beings, something about our psychology, which means actually we can do this sort of thing without having to answer these questions. In effect, it's almost as if we intuit that we have to think in this way to do this, in this way to do this, and actually we can hold these things together but the processes involved are more intuitive than thought through. So let's come back to the point that E.O. Wilson makes in his book, Consilience. And Wilson is very, very enthusiastic about this idea of interdisciplinarity and why it's so important. And he writes that the future of human civilization will depend on what he calls synthesizers, those who can make connections across disciplines. Interestingly, this quote he gives us, we are drowning in information while starving for wisdom. Wisdom, in Wilson's view, is about making connections. In effect, being able to tie together what's happening here with what's happening there, and as a result, having an enriched or a deepened vision of what the whole thing is all about. And the question that this book, The Territories of Human Reason, is really doing is saying we have this, this difficulty, which is that we do multiple things, and those of us who do multiple things find we use multiple methods to do them. And the question we have to ask is, does that mean, in effect, we are schizophrenic, to abuse a word, or does it mean, in effect, we just say, this is the way it is. You do this in different ways, with different approaches, and we find some way of simply pragmatically or psychologically holding these together as we try to get these disciplines to talk to each other and give us a richer and deeper vision of rationality. Let me end with Einstein. Um, interesting, because Einstein, as many of you will know, felt very strongly about his science, he felt very strongly about his socialism, didn't talk about that very much because he was based in North America and just felt it was prudent not to, and also had some very idiosyncratic views of religion, but he felt they were all very important. And when you read Einstein, these all matter, and somehow he holds them together, and he gives us very few clues as to how he does it, but it's quite obvious that he knew it had to be done. And so in many ways, this book, The Territories of Human Reason, is simply saying we do live in an age of multiple rationalities, and that is not necessarily about the complete fragmentation or balkanization of the academic world, nor is it a recipe for saying you do whatever you want, you think whatever you want. It's much more an invitation to think about how we weave together insights which originate from different 
rational context, but which have the potential to enrich our vision of reality, even though they're generated by different methods and very often by different people. And as someone who thinks it is very important to trespass across boundaries, to try and bring things together, to try and integrate these ideas, this is an intellectual difficulty I am very conscious of working with. And so this book is simply saying, here's the problem, here seem to be some solutions, can we begin to talk about this more? I think it's interesting. And in many ways, this book is both an invitation to trespass across disciplinary boundaries, but also to think through disciplinary issues, the issue of rationality that this raises. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>